So I want to raise an issue of internal politics vis-a-vis another foreign policy question that you deal with in your book, which is uh, India-Sri Lanka relations. Uh, you have an excellent chapter on uh, the end game as it evolved and the kind of questions that India was confronted with. Uh, how do you respond to uh, an increasingly bloody civil war where all rules of war are being flouted, uh, external powers are getting, you know, there's a risk of external powers getting sucked into it. Uh, and uh, India within that context makes various choices. To what extent were those choices uh, the product of internal political uh, compulsions as well, uh, or to what extent were those choices made in the teeth of great internal political difficulties? Because we know that uh, the DMK government, I mean the uh, Tamil Nadu you can say as a whole, um, I lived in Madras during those years, the closing stages and uh, this was a big emotive issue. Uh, how much do you think domestic politics weighed on the UPA's decision making process? I think sentiment was strong, but not just in Tamil Nadu, I think, you know, in India itself. Uh, because Indians are fundamentally moral in the way they look at these things. But we did have a strategic interest and that was the whole problem of how to reconcile your strategic interest in what is essentially an unsinkable aircraft carrier 14 miles off your coast and you know your humanitarian interests in the fate of people and also your domestic political interests and so on. So it was really a balance of all these factors. Whether we got it right or not, you know, frankly, history will say. Right. And we will, those who were involved, I think, will always wonder, could we have done more one way or the other? But what if, you know, stand still in the corner? Right. This is not a question we can ever answer. The reason I put it all down was just to show how difficult it is to make some of these choices. You know, you historians, journalists have 20-20 hindsight and can always second guess and say, you should have done this and this would have happened and, you know, we could have sorted it out. But on an issue like that, I think if you look at it, it's, it's really a complex issue. Right. And there's no right or wrong, black or white, true or false. It's not a binary choice here in any of these situations. And you're operating in a fog right. where you don't actually know everything that's happening. So you do the best you can. You sort of minimax. You minimize harm, maximize gain and go along. And that's what I wanted to convey. In fact, if you look, that's the theme that really runs through the book. Right. That, and therefore, I think you need to give government some room when you judge it. Right. Uh, because it has its reasons and it, it knows more than most of us do outside. And I think, but I hope that it creates some understanding of the complexity of what, right. what, what government has to right. do. Uh, regardless of decisions or choices that the government made finally during the Sri Lankan civil war endgame, the fact is that the war ended and uh, in the post-war scenario, it was the Chinese uh, that had a strength in hand, their relationship with the Rajapaksa government. Um, could that's things politics that and I think that's something you have to deal with. Right. I mean, as China rises, China's presence in your neighborhood is something you have to deal with. Right. In the Sri Lankan case, actually, we tend to forget history very quickly. You remember the fuss in India in 1967 about the rice rubber pact between Sri Lanka and China. Throughout the war, because we were in no position to supply weapons and so right. on, Sri Lanka bought weapons from China, right. primarily. Uh, they got a few from other places, but basically they, were, they equipped their army and so on from China. Right. So, uh, Which then know, extracted economic and strategic rents and from, yeah. from them. Yeah. I mean, so that's a relationship that... And I think we should get used to the idea that all our smaller neighbors, if they see India-China rivalry, will find it useful to deal with us right. in order to get things from the Chinese, right. deal with the Chinese right. in order to get things from right. us. This, I mean, I would do it if right. I were a smaller neighbor, the, and I would maximize my gains. So I think we should be right. ready for this. And I don't think we should aim for exclusivity or some zone right. where we will where only people will only deal with us, right. why would they put themselves in that position? They're sovereign states, independent. The, there was a delicious moment at a conference in Delhi last year, the so-called Raisina Dialogues, uh, where you had on one platform, I think it was the Indian Foreign Minister, Sushmaji, or maybe Jashankar was there, and uh, important leaders from Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, um, and Afghanistan. And uh, this was the conference where India, for the first time publicly, um, articulated a negative view about one belt, one road, and said how this is in some way a unilateral gesture and that mm -hmm. these are not helpful. The 
smaller neighbors of India all essentially piped up to say, well, we, we quite like the idea of one belt, one road. Uh, I know this takes us back to China in a way, but uh, insofar as this is also a regional question, mm. uh, India needs to be more balanced in the way it evaluates uh, the kind of connectivity that China is creating. Look at it more as an opportunity, perhaps, and less as encirclement. Well, I think, you know, infrastructure is infrastructure. As long as it's open to everyone, I think we should use what's in our interest, what helps us to pursue our goals. And where it directly affects our sovereign interests, like parts of the CEP, for instance, CPEC, what China is doing in Pakistan occupied Kashmir, or uh, those, I think we, sh we have a legitimate right not just to object, but to see what we can do about it. Uh, but uh, for the rest of it, most roads, pipelines, these are all value neutral. Right. And as long as they're open to everybody and there's no other conditions attached to them, that, you know, only my friends can walk on this road and right, so on. Right. I think those are things that we, we should actually look at right. and see where we can use them. Okay. Uh, you know, and in practice, we actually do it. If you look at the Chinese built terminals in Colombo port, they survive on Indian transshipment, on transshipment of goods from India to the rest of the world and from the rest of the world to India, because our ports lack the capability. So it's actually providing a service to us, right. which is useful to us. Uh, and we, we find, we, I find we tend to do that in reality, but I don't think we've quite got our heads around this, right. this idea of interdependence, of actually using infrastructure that other people might build, and thereby also being more confident of the uses they're being put to. Right. Uh, you focused on the end game, of course, of the Sri Lankan civil war. There were choices that India made at the beginning of the game, too, uh, in, in arming and financing the LTTE. Are you, is there a danger? in the context of other regional problems, Pakistan, Balochistan in particular, that uh, an issue that we have now begun to raise and articulate publicly might get overplayed. Uh, Pakistanis understand. have made these allegations against India in the past. Yeah. Um, you know, it's very difficult to comment on something where, frankly, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what, what has actually been done. Right. Uh, all we had was a statement by the PM about human rights in Balochistan, which I think is <coughs> legitimate. I think there is a real problem right. of human rights in Balochistan. Yeah. But as, 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 of the, as of the Rohingyas in Myanmar, but we don't, we don't hear much on that. And it gives me a certain pleasure to right. see us talking in Balochistan when we did in Sharm el Sheikh. And there was well, I was there with you and everybody attacked you. For that. <laughs> but now I'm happy to see that everybody is singing the same tune. But frankly, right. I think it's very hard to comment right. without you know, knowing what's actually right. going on. Mr. Menon, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you for writing this book. And I hope that we will continue to interact. Uh, for the benefit of readers and viewers of The Wire. I look forward to that. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you.